Hi, this is the voice, Michael Chavello. You're listening to the Premium Odds Cast, hosted by leading MMA odds maker Nick Kalikas, fight scientist and author of Fightnomics, Reed Kuhn, and MMA journalist Brian Heminger. The absolute best UFC betting info, picks, statistics, and analysis from the most respected authority in mixed martial arts betting, MMAOddsBreaker.com. Welcome to the Premium Obscast, presented by Five Dimes and Countermove, your home for fantasy MMA. I'm Brian Hemminger, joined today by leading mixed martial arts odds maker Nick Kalikas to break down this Saturday's UFC 187 pay-per-view event, which takes place in Las Vegas, Nevada. If you're unfamiliar with our format, myself and Nick will be breaking down the fight card from top to bottom, providing extensive analysis and a pick for each fight after doing our film study for the event. Then, fight scientist Reed Kuhn will step in and offer his expansive numerical insight on all bouts with sufficient data. Today, Reed will be able to contribute on eight total bouts. Briefly looking back at our last event, our premium package bets for UFC Fight Night 66 went 1-1 one one to lose 0.5 units overall. We won our bet on Ning Gyung Yao, but we lost our underdog play on Hyung Ju Lim after a strong start. We also lost a one-unit free prop bet on Gegard Musasi inside the distance. Back to the present, UFC 187 features a 12-fight card in total and will be aired on UFC Fight Pass, Fox Sports 1, and Pay-Per-View this Saturday night. Let's dive right in. Now, kicking off the preliminary card on Fight Pass, we have a flyweight contest between Justin Scoggins, who is 9-2, and and Josh Sampo, who is 11-4. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight, and how has the public shifted things so far? I opened Scoggins minus 305 to come back on sample plus 225. And right now it's Scoggins minus 350 to come back on sample is plus 290. All lines are courtesy of five dimes.eu. And getting into this matchup, I mean, I'm, I'm not surprised at all that Scoggins is getting bet up a little bit because the guy is such a talented fighter. No doubt about it. Um, obviously he's got the striking background, the karate background. I mean, the guy is a very technical striker, a, a very smooth striker, has a ton of ability on the feet, knockout power to go along with it. He's just tremendous to watch, a fun guy to watch on the feet. But the, the impressive thing is, is the guy has been working on his wrestling, um, and his overall ground game. And, and that's been, in my opinion, huge for him in fights. I know he's coming off two straight losses. I mean, he got caught in a guillotine choke by Moraga. And that Ortiz fight was competitive, and it could realistically went the other way. Um, but at the same time, he showed what he's capable of even as far as wrestling goes by taking some of these guys down and controlling guys that have pretty good wrestling um so scoggins is developing into a, just a very talented overall fighter he's still a little raw i mean getting caught in that guillotine choke shows that but i think he's going to actually learn from his mistakes and get even better so in my opinion scoggins is actually going to be uh, eventually a title contender and fight for that title at one point and he's not going to be an easy out uh, whether it's dj or anybody else holding the belt for sure i mean he's gonna he's only 23 years old he's gonna get better and with the progress he's already showed wow i mean the sky's really the limit for this guy that being said sample i mean he's a very solid um flyweight as well i mean he's more than impressive i know he's looked a little i guess uh, concerning, uh, he's looked a little bad recently. I mean, his fight against Makovsky, he was competitive in that fight, but he definitely um, deserved to lose that fight. And then, but Holohan was the one that's that was a real big question mark. I mean, it seemed like the guy at times has trouble cutting weight, um, and he just didn't show up for that Holohan fight at all. Um, and it showed because he got uh, beat early in that fight. So there's, he's just not as consistent as you'd like to see. But the guy is a very talented fighter because he is so well rounded. He doesn't. Uh, have bad ability on the feet. The guy definitely is a decent striker, but what he excels at, I think the most is his ground game, his wrestling again, his submission game, but he puts it all together fairly good. So Sampo is a very talented fighter, but here against Scoggins, honestly, if he doesn't catch Scoggins by sub, I think Scoggins has the ability to finish Sampo on the feet because he's the better striker, has more of a knockout potential for sure. I think Scoggins could actually control Sample on the ground as well, maintain top position, um, do some damage on the floor that way as well. So Sample's really main shot at winning this fight is, usually we say a puncher's chance, is actually a submitter's chance. If he could catch Scoggins again in something crazy, um, maybe a guillotine choke or something of that nature, a rear naked choke if he catches his back and scramble, yes, he could probably pull off the upset that way. But besides that, I don't see him winning this fight. I think Scoggins gets back on track here. I think he wins this fight. He's impressive doing so. And he's continued to move back up the ladder because at 125, Scoggins is legit, and he's a threat to most. So my official pick is Scoggins to win this fight. And even though he is on a bit of a little losing skid here, 
I'm still a big believer in Justin Scoggins. He did make a couple changes here. He was training at American Top Team, but now he's working with Sarah McMahon's gym. So we'll see if the change in scenery helps him out here. His last couple fights, he was way too focused on the takedowns than his biggest strength, which has been his kicking. He still really hasn't showcased that in the UFC, despite having three fights already. So far, he's mainly been trying to take guys down and work them over with ground and pound and some submissions. And on the feet, this guy is a dynamo. He has some of the best kicks in the entire flyweight roster. I think this might be finally the fight that we get to see it. But if not, then this fight's going to be a lot more competitive than we were expecting. Scoggins is the younger fighter than Sampo. He's, in my opinion, the more resilient fighter. Sampo did get rocked really badly by Pat Houlihan. So I think on the feet, Scoggins definitely could knock Sampo out. On the ground, however, this fight is a lot closer. Josh Sampo is a very good wrestler. He's a good scrambler. Had a very impressive finish of Ryan Benoit in his UFC debut. So I do think that Sampo has a chance to out-wrestle Scoggins, win some scrambles, and maybe even tap him out. Scoggins did get submitted by John Moraga in his last fight, so that is a concern. Uh, that being said, Sampo does not have a great gas tank. I think Scoggins could just wear him down with a good pace, even if this fight does go to the canvas. So uh, while Sampo is going to be competitive on the ground, I still think it's Justin Scoggins' fight to lose. It's just if I'm getting close to to giving up almost on Scoggins after such a strong start and all the hype and being so excited about this guy being a potential contender in the division, it's time to start living up to it. And he needs to beat a guy like Josh Sampo if he wants to do that. So I'm picking Josh Justin Scoggins, not crazy confident in it, but I, I do think that he should win this fight, especially if it stays standing. Now moving up to the lightweight division, we have Islam Makachev, who is 11-0, taking on Leo Kuntz, who is 17-1-1. Now, Nick, what's the MMA odds maker's perspective on this one? I opened Makachev minus 300. The comeback on Kuntz is plus 220. Right now, over at Five Dimes, it's Makachev minus 320. The comeback is plus 260 on Kuntz. So a little bit more actually coming in Makachev's way. As far as stylistically how these guys match up, both of these guys are, well, I, I guess you can't consider Kuntz as much of a prospect, but Makachev is definitely a young prospect. He's only 22 years old, trains out of uh, Russia, um, a training partner of Habib, actually, over when he's in Russia, too. So, And he's got a lot of similarities to Habib. Um, he's a powerful grinder, undefeated, hyped young prospect, for sure. Uh, he has an impressive resume, uh, Makachev does, outside of the UFC, obviously, in, uh, in the Euro circuit. He's got some solid wins. He's a former Russian combat sambo champion. Um, so overall, the guy on the ground is definitely game. Um, on the feet, he throws a little wild at times, um, but he's not, he's not the most technical fighter, but he can be very effective. Uh, but it's a solid wrestling base that's the most impressive thing about him because he's relentless with his takedown attempts. If he doesn't get the first one, he changes things up well, and uh, he's able to adapt and get the fight to the floor more times than not. Um, he does have a very aggressive ground attack, good submission game to go along with it. Um, and his cardio, for the most part, is okay. He does tend to slow down a little bit because of his grinding style, but um, it is what it is with him. I think he can definitely go three strong here and uh, pull off this victory over a guy like Kuntz. Now, Kuntz, on the other hand, another guy that has a little bit of hype behind him, but he is a former tough 16 veteran. Uh, he was actually KO'd by Sam Alvey in the elimination round. But overall, he's a pretty well-rounded fighter. Um, he's from North Dakota, and he's actually the um, – in North Dakota, he's 175 – 170 pound welterweight title uh, holder there. So um, he should be, honestly, if you look at his tape, he should be a little bit better than what his tape shows. I think um, one of the problems with um, Kuntz that I've seen is he does have decent takedown defense at times, but against guys that are persistent, he does get end up getting put on his back. And so stylistically against a guy like Makashev, it doesn't seem like it's a very good fight for him. Um, but overall, I mean, he is a pretty solid fighter. He mixes on the feet. He mixes his stuff up well, his hands and feet. He's got a good clinch game. He works behind a pretty decent uh, left jab. Um, so he's okay in all areas, but he's just not that great in anything really, to be honest with you. I, I think striking is probably his best attribute. Um, and he does have very good cardio. I give him that. And I think that's one of the highlights for him. I think he can go three strong. And a lot of times what he does is even if he's getting beat early on, he manages to hang in there and then start taking over a fight as it goes in round two, round three. So he's that kind of fighter. Um, and he's not going to be an easy out. I mean, I think he'll be able to stuff a few takedowns. 
along the way, but ultimately it's going to be a bad fight for him. And I think he is going to get grinded out and lose here. So my official pick is going to be Makashev. And I'm really high on Makashev. I think this guy is incredibly talented. He is a terrific wrestler and he's been rounding out his game. He's actually good just about everywhere. Now, technically he's not the greatest striker, but he has some good power. He's very good in the clinch. That wasn't one of his strengths, but it's something that he's definitely been improving. And his wrestling is phenomenal. This guy gets on top of you. He has a good base. He will hold you down, beat you up, potentially submit you. He had a really solid track record in M1, beat some pretty good prospects along the way. And, of course, as we know, he is a, a training partner of Habib Nurmagomedov when Habib does come back to Dagestan. So I really think this guy he has all the potential in the world. My, my only real concern with him is he is still a little young in the game and mainly is he's not a huge lightweight. So even though uh, Leo Kuntz isn't a, a big lightweight either, he has experience fighting at welterweight. So maybe he could bully Makashev a little bit, but probably not. Because overall, skill for skill, Kuntz is just not on Makashev's level. Makashev is one of the better prospects that the UFC has signed for their lightweight division in a long time, in my opinion. And uh, Kuntz, he is uh, got a wrestling background, so... Basically, he got into MMA because he got sick of uh, being in wrestling matches and knowing that if he could have thrown strikes, he could uh, have won. So I think he's adapted well, and he definitely beat up a lot of guys on the local scene in the North Dakota area. And now he does have some good training going on at American Top Team. So I'm very interested to see if he has continued to develop and he definitely will have to be working on that takedown defense because Makachev is going to be putting a lot of pressure on him, going to be shooting for takedowns, going to be transitioning, going to be mixing up the takedowns, switching from one to another if one doesn't work. So I think Kuntz is going to be on the defensive here for the most part of the fight. And on the feet, Kuntz really doesn't offer a whole lot. He doesn't have uh, a lot of punching power on the feet. He throws kicks pretty well, but... Overall, I think Magashev will actually be the better striker as well, which I would not have expected against most people for his UFC debut. Now, uh, in terms of the ground, Kuntz, if he can get on top, is actually pretty strong, but Magashev is the better wrestler here. He should win the scrambles. He should get on top. And overall, I do expect Magashev to not just win, but I think win impressively with a, a dominant decision or maybe even a knockout if he can find enough space to land some big ground and pound. So overall, I think Makashev makes a really impressive UFC debut and I'm picking him to win. Now moving up to the welterweight division, we have Mike Pyle, who is 26-10-1, taking on Colby Covington, who is 7-0. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight and how has the public shifted things so far? Up in Covington, minus 170, the comeback on Pyle, plus 130. Competitive line that has skyrocketed a little bit. Now it's Covington, minus 270, so 100 cents higher than my opener. Comeback on Pyle is plus 230. A lot of support coming in on Covington, and you know what? I realize why. Um, I did open it a little bit low, and it's, a lot of people are just banking on Pyle's chin, letting him down again, and it's, Believable. I mean, it's definitely a problem from Pyle at this point. I mean, especially as he's not getting any younger. He's 39 years old and he's facing a rising prospect in Covington that's actually looked okay um, since entering the UFC, no doubt about it. Um, I'm just a little bit surprised with how much confidence people do have in Covington out there. I mean, I know, again, he's got the hype behind him, trains at a good camp with American Top Team, um, and he's only going to get better and better with each fight, with more confidence, with more training, no doubt about it. And Covington has that wrestling background um, that, you know, works in MMA, definitely. I mean, he, he's able to get the fight to the floor. He's able to control people. He's got a pretty decent submission game to go along with it as well. So there's a lot of good things to like about Covington. But this is going to be an intriguing matchup and a tough one because if he doesn't knock Pyle out, even on the ground, when you put Pyle on his back, obviously, I mean, look at his Rick Story fight. I mean, the judges thought he did enough there to win the fight. I don't agree with that decision against Story. I thought Story won the fight. But, I mean, Pyle was busy enough that you can see – why some of the judges could have went that way with it. Um, and his submission game is definitely legit as well. So Covington's going to have to be careful even if he gets the takedowns on Pyle. Pyle's get definitely going to be game. I mean, he's a savvy vet. He's been in there with the best of the best overall. Um, so this is a, a decent step up in competition, I think, for Covington. So at the current line, I don't necessarily agree, 
agree with uh, how crazy it did get. I think people that are expecting Covington to have an easy win, if he doesn't knock pile out, again, it's going to be very interesting. So hard to pick against Covington, though, because I do think at 39 years old, the chin is not going to get any better. And even though Covington doesn't have a ton of knockout power, it doesn't take much, I think, these days to knock a guy like Pyle out. So I'm not sure mentally where Pyle is right now um, either. And I, again, you got a kind of a hungry young warrior in Covington um, stepping in here. So I'm not going to pick against the guy, but I just think at the current price, people might be a little bit uh, counting Pyle out a little bit too much. But I do think that Covington, more times than not, should get the win, especially at this stage of Pyle's career. Um, and I think he's going to do it by either grinding Pyle out or by knocking him out. So my official pick is going to be Covington. Just be careful out there, those that are laying the juice or even throwing them in some parlays. I think that there's a lot of fighters on here that you could parlay on this card from top to bottom, a lot of big favorites. So just be cautious on this one. I do think that it could be a trap fight for Colby Covington. Covington had it pretty easy so far in his UFC career, taking on An Ying Wang and Wagner Silva in his first two fights. Those are two about bottom of the barrel in the UFC welterweight division as you can get. And yeah, he looked really good against uh, Wang in his UFC debut, but his last fight, even though he did get a, a late finish, he had a, a bit of difficulty there against Silva. He had to really work for some takedowns. The, the striking, he didn't really present much. And I think it kind of exposed a couple of his flaws here. Uh, basically, Covington needs to get takedowns and top position, or he's going to be in a little bit of trouble. And against a guy like Mike Pyle, who's such a savvy vet, I think it could present some problems. The other thing is, Covington is taking this fight on short notice. It'll be about one month since he stepped in for the injured Sean Spencer. So... While it's not a crazy short notice fight for him, it, it is a little bit and he might not have a chance to get a full training camp. And especially against a guy like Mike Pyle, who is a very dangerous, very savvy veteran, that's something that could be a, a big problem. Now, Covington has excellent wrestling. When he does get on top of you, he is dangerous, both with submissions and with ground and pound. But that's what he needs to do. And Mike Pyle is much more dangerous in open space against Covington. I think Mike Pyle has the better submission game. And Mike Pyle does have some underrated wrestling. I mean, who can forget the clinic he put on John Hathaway to end that uh, Brits hype? So uh, Mike Pyle is a very dangerous guy. The, the biggest problem with Mike Pyle right now is, one, his chin, which when he does lose, he usually loses in devastating fashion by knockout. And then two is his age. He is 39 years old. So as we all know, when fighters get older, they get easier to knock out. They slow down their reflexes, everything. So Covington is coming into this fight with a 12-year age advantage and, in my opinion, the better wrestler. But that does not mean that he's going to come in here and just walk all over Mike Pyle. I think this is probably three or four times tougher than any opponent Covington's faced in his UFC career so far. And I'm not convinced that he's going to be able to pass this test. I think if Mike Pyle keeps this fight standing, he could not just outstrike Covington, but he could put him away. Pyle, while he doesn't have a great chin, he has some serious knockout power. And I think uh, there's a good chance that Pyle could actually finish this fight. So Pyle is going to be the longer, taller guy. He's going to have a good reach here. And if he uses it well, he has a, a higher pace, higher accuracy. And uh, I think that Mike Pyle has a really good shot of not just winning, but potentially knocking out Colby Covington. So I'm picking Mike Pyle as a pretty big underdog here. Now dropping all the way down to the women's strawweight division, we have Rose Nama Yunus, who is three and two, taking on Nina Ansarov, who is six and four. Now, Nick, what's the MMA odds maker's perspective on this one? I put Nama Yunus minus 280. The comeback on Ansarov is plus 200. And right now it's minus 280 plus 240. So line margins have basically tightened up a little bit. Nama Yunus, of course, had that tremendous amount of hype considering, I mean, her run on Ultimate Fighter was outstanding. I mean, she's a very talented fighter. I know she had that setback in the final fight uh, for the title, actually, the, for the strawweight title against Carla Esparza, um, which was surprising to most, but at the same time, looking back at it, um, it's not that shocking either. So, uh, Sparza is a very talented wrestler, grappler, and uh, she just 
was able to get the job done against uh, Nama Yunus in that spot. Ansaroff, though, this isn't going to be another easy fight. I mean, I, like I said, I think with the hype and the popularity of Nama Yunus, I'm surprised the line hasn't actually climbed up a little bit more because she's a talented fighter. She's got kind of, you know, what a lot of people like Dana White and all those people say, some fighters have the it factor. I think Nama Yunus does have the it factor in a lot of ways. Um, um, I guess Ansaroff, though, skill for skill set for skill set, I think Nama Yunus does have the advantage in this fight. I think that's She's capable of getting the fight to the floor if she wants. I think she's got a little bit underrated wrestler in her wrestling in her own right. I think she's a very talented striker, a more talented striker than Ansaroff is, is as well. But Ansaroff is going to be game in every area. I think that I know that she got uh, taken down and controlled, and that her decision loss in her official UFC debut against Lima. Um, I don't think it's going to be that lopsided here against Nama Yunus. I think it's going to actually be a very competitive fight um, and it'll go back and forth. So this is a tough spot. So I think a lot of people not going crazy, even though I'm surprised the line hasn't moved up is probably the right call because I think, you know, a lot of times you can't really gauge how good a fighter is by one or two fights. And if you look back again at her debut against Lima, it was a different type of matchup. And I think she's going to have a little bit more success against Nama Yunus in this spot. So answer off getting into her background a little bit. She's a pretty well-rounded, experienced veteran. I mean, she does excel with uh, on the feet and with her striking game. Uh, she's pretty powerful, actually, for the 115-pound division as well. And she's got pretty technical striking. She's got a decent submission game to go along with, a little bit underrated at times. Um, but again, in that Lima fight, her takedown defense is what cost her that fight. Now, Yunus, I think, is just a little bit more dangerous everywhere. Um, the fight takes place. And I'm expecting her, again, to maybe get a takedown or two along the way. Even if Nama Yunus gets put on her back, I think she, she could be okay there because she does have the submission edge over um, Ansaroff slightly. Um, and I think on the feet, even though Ansaroff is going to be game, I think Nama Yunus should get her on the feet as well. So I'm expecting a very competitive fight. The judges could butcher this thing if it does hit the scorecards. Um, but there is a possibility. I mean, a lot of times you don't see a finish in – the women's divisions. I think there is a possibility we see a finish here because both these ladies are definitely more than capable of finishing the fight. And at the same time, they do have some flaws in their defense. So I'm not a very confident pick, to be honest with you. I know that's going to be surprising to most. I think it's going to be a lot closer than people indicate, but I am picking Nama Yunus to win this fight. And I relatively agree. I, I think that Nama Yunus should definitely win this fight. And Anzarov really did not impress me that much in her UFC debut. She went in there against Juliana Lima, and she was put on her back in all three rounds. Her takedown defense was definitely exposed, and while she didn't get submitted, I mean, she really did not offer much up whatsoever. Now, Rose does not have the wrestling of Juliana Lima, so I expect a completely different fight this time around. Probably a little bit more stand-up based, because Rose does have uh, some pretty kooky stand-up style. She'll throw a lot of uh, kicks, she'll throw... A a lot of unorthodox attacks. She comes at you from all different sorts of angles. Ansaroff is a little, even though she comes from a tight Quanto background, Ansaroff is a little more fundamental. So she'll be throwing a lot of straight punches, some powerful kicks. Ansaroff does have more pure one punch power than Rose, but I don't expect Rose to, to get knocked out or anything, even if Ansaroff connects solidly. Uh, Rose took some of the best shots that Tisha Torres could offer and held up pretty well. So on the ground, I do think that Rose definitely has the better submission game. She has a very dynamic, very uh, flexible game on the ground, and she could definitely pull something off, whether it be an arm bar, uh, a Kimura, a choke. I definitely think that if this fight goes to the canvas, Rose is going to be presenting a lot of threats. But on the feet, Anzaroff, if she can control the center of the cage, she might actually be able to outwork Rose and outlander in terms of the, the power shots. So she could actually impress the judges here. So uh, I, I definitely agree that this fight is relatively close and there's not a real easy method to victory for Rose. Although I do think that if she just pushes the pace and maybe she could outwork Enzerov. So my pick is Rose, but I'm not that confident. Now moving up to the middleweight division, we have Uriah Hall, who was 11 and 4 taking on Rafael Natal, who is 19-6-1. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight, and how has the public shifted things so far? I opened Hall minus 210, the comeback on Natal, plus 160, and there has been a decent amount of action coming in on this fight. Everybody all over Hall. He is now minus 350, the comeback on Natal is plus 290. 
I guess I can understand it. I mean, Uriah Hall has had a lot of hype behind him since the Ultimate Fighter show, of course. And I mean, skill set for skill set. Hall has all the tools to be a great fighter, no doubt about it, and be a contender at 185. Um, and Natal, the biggest issue here, the way these guys match up, Natal is the better overall fighter. I, I think there's no doubt about that as well. I think Natal has decent stand up. He's got better pure wrestling, I think, than uh, Hall does as well. And then, of course, jiu-jitsu on the ground, the advantage goes to Natal. But overall, Hall's a little bit bigger, stronger. Um, as far as striking goes, he's the more dangerous of the two fighters as well. And he's got the better chin. Natal's chin issues, I think, is what everybody's banking against here. That's why they're getting uh, in on Hall when they could, especially at the uh, opening number. So I can understand it. I just think that if Hall does not knock Natal out, it's going to be a close fight. If it hits the scorecards, it's going to be a very competitive fight because I think like I said, Natal's wrestling is actually better of the two, but his gas tank in, in most cases as well, that's another letdown spot. I should mention that. Um, a lot of times you see Natal slowing down in round two and round three. Now, in his last fight against Watson, surprisingly, Natal looked great. I mean, his cardio was on key. Everything was on point. I mean, I think that was one of the best performances that Natal's had. So he's coming off a very impressive performance. But that being said, Watson looked terrible in that fight. Um, so I don't know how much credit we can really give Natal in, in that regard. And, and then Hall, he has been looking a little bit more, I guess, keyed in in his fights. He's he's a little bit more focused. He's got a little bit more confidence now. I mean, he's won three straight after a couple disappointing, surprising losses that he suffered as well. So I think he's finally getting some momentum on his side. So I can understand it. It is, it is hard to pick against Hall in this spot because, like I said, I think he's just physically the better athlete. He's a little bit stronger, and he could do damage and probably knock Natal out and even has a better cardio in most cases as well. So even though Natal is the more well-rounded fighter, the better fighter in my opinion, it's still hard to pick against Hall here because he has, I think, a, a little bit more of a clear path to victory here. He could probably knock Natal out. If not, he could probably win by decision. So I am going to pick Hall. I just don't agree with how high the line is right now because in my opinion, this is definitely the toughest test for Hall to date. Not a confident pick, but I am going to go with Hall. Yeah, and Hall is the pretty obvious choice. The The main reason that, that Hall seems so obvious is of Natal's six career losses, Four of them have been by knockout, uh, two of them in the UFC and then two before the UFC. So it, it definitely is a very real possibility that if Uriah Hall connects with something solid on Natal's chin, he's going to go out. I mean, he just does not have that ability to absorb good punishment. I think he's been a little lucky in his last two fights that he's been matched up against opponents that don't have a lot of pure one punch power in Chris Camozzi and Tom Watson. And, uh, he was really, he looked great against Watson. I mean, Nick can say, Nick said that Watson looked uh, pretty terrible, but I think that also was because Natal put it all together and, and was fighting a complete fight. In this fight, however, I think that even though Natal is the more well-rounded of the two, he is in big trouble if this stays standing for extended periods of time. Uriah Hall does have a tendency to sit back and, and let the fight happen instead of pushing his own uh, agenda, pushing his pace. But I think here, it's more of a, a situation where at some point on the feet, Uriah Hall is going to connect with something, whether it's a crazy kick or some spinning back fist or an elbow or a punch, and Natal goes down. Natal needs to get this fight to the ground with a sense of urgency. And uh, it's very possible because he does have a pretty good ground game and some decent wrestling, but I'm just not sure he'll be able to do it before he gets knocked out. And even if he does do it, I don't know if he'll be able to finish the fight on the ground because he would otherwise need to do it for three straight rounds to win a decision. So I think at some point Uriah Hall connects and puts him out, so I'm going to pick Uriah Hall. Now, Reed, what do the numbers tell us for this one? Well, first of all, they agree with you that um, Rafael Natal is actually the better grappler. The problem is that we don't really see it very often, at least not lately. Uh, Uriah Hall was defeated by two aggressive wrestlers, John Howard, Kevin Gastelum, Guys that were willing to mix it up, change levels, press forward, those were very close decisions. But it shows that if you push your eye hall back, he can't really unleash all those crazy moves that he that made him famous. Um, that said, he is always going to be the bigger, stronger guy. Uh, he's going to be the rangier guy. He's a pretty precise, accurate striker, but carries a lot of power on those strikes. And he's very, very hard to hit. He has excellent evasiveness, partially because of his range. Natal, on the other hand, um, he actually does have some decent power uh, and has decent defense. But his chin is a liability here. 
you know, his knockdown rate is above average, but his chin is way below average. So punch for punch during an exchange, he's more likely to fall down than knock someone down. And that's a dangerous spot to be in against a guy like Hall, who packs a lot of heat and throws some moves that really swing for the fences. So um, I do see that as a big liability, and that's why you can't really bank on Natal to pull off some miraculous upset. He would really have to grind this out get it to the mat frequently every round to get Hall out, out of his element. And I just don't see that happening. Um, I don't see Natal as, as being able to push that kind of pace for three rounds. Hall, I think, has evolved since he first came out. He was a big disappointment. And at some point, you got to ask yourself if we're maybe discounting him a little bit. Um, maybe part of that was skill, part of that was nerves, but he has gotten more aggressive. He even injured himself in that one fight and kept pressing forward and and throwing kicks with a broken toe. Um, so I'm a little bit more impressed with I am with Hall right now uh, than obviously after dropping two in a row to smaller guys. Um, so I'm going with Hall here. I do think there's a lot of potential for a knockout win, um, but barring that, you know, th- it is a little bit closer than the odds suggest, and that's why I think you got to take a more specific play with Hall rather than lay too much juice. All right, excellent. Thanks, Reed. Now, dropping down to the welterweight division, we have Dong Hyung Kim, who is 19-3-1 with one no contest, taking on Josh Berkman, who is 28-11. Now, Nick, what's the MMA oddsmaker's perspective on this one? I opened Kim minus 270, the comeback on Berkman plus 190, and right now it's minus 280, plus 240, so line margins have tightened up a bit, and there's two-way action on this fight, so line hasn't moved crazy on this one. And it is a competitive fight. I mean, Kim in my opinion, has become one of the best um, welterweights in the weight class. I mean, doing what he does best, grinding people out. He's been a little bit more aggressive in his recent fights as well, showing some uh, knockout power to go along with it. It cost him in his last fight, obviously, against a guy like Woodley um, because with over-aggression comes some flawed defense as well, and that's exactly what Kim has. He also has a suspect chain. We were talking about that in the last fight. I think you can kind of put Kim in that category, not as bad as Natal for sure, but he is the type of guy that you can knock out if you have a lot of power. So Kim has to be careful here, and I think he has to go back to his roots and trying to grind Berkman out because I think that's his best path to victory here um, against a guy like Berkman because Berkman is pretty explosive. I mean, he's obviously been a true veteran of the sport. He's been around for a long time, so I'm glad to see him back in the, the mix of things with the UFC. He was a lot more competitive than people thought against a guy like Hector Lombard, which was impressive. He still lost that fight, no doubt about it, but still, I mean, he had a little bit of life there, and a lot of people were thinking that he was just going to get demolished in that fight. So credit to him. Uh, for hanging in there and, and, you know, surviving at least and uh, doing what he did there. Against Kim, it is a step down, though. I mean, if you look at Lombard and Kim, this is a much better fight for uh, Berkman stylistically because I do think that he could do some damage. I think Berkman is overall the better striker here. I think Kim has it, his advantages. He's the better grappler wrestler. He can get the fight to the floor, obviously. Um, but if it stays on the feet, I give the slight edge to Berkman, honestly, because I think Berkman is a little bit more explosive with the striking. He has more pure knockout power. He's got a better chin. I mean, it's been tested time and time again. And even though he's been rocked in fights, I mean, he's stayed on his feet and uh, he's just a warrior. So chin advantage goes to Berkman. Grappling, wrestling edge goes to Kim. So really, it depends on what kind of game plan Kim's going to implement here against Berkman. I think overall, Berkman also very dangerous with the submission game. I mean, he hops on, you know, a quick guillotine. He gets around your neck. I mean, the guy can definitely finish most guys in that weight class as well. I mean, he was able to rock a guy like John Fitch. A lot of people say Fitch is past his prime or whatever, but he rocked him and then submitted him fairly quickly, put him all the way out, actually, in that fight. So that's the kind of finishing potential that a guy like Berkman has. So I've been kind of bouncing back and forth on this fight, honestly, as far as a pure pick. I'm going to slightly lean towards the underdog here, I guess, in Berkman, because I do think that stylistically it's a good fight for him. If he maintains standing and he's able to keep off his back and not let Kim utilize what he's best at, I think Berkman can, Berkman can definitely win this fight. So I'm going to go with Berkman here. Um, again, kind of going back and forth, so I might sway and change by time weigh-ins come around on this fight because it's that kind of fight for me but it is definitely a dog or pass situation i believe here and i'm going to go with uh, berkman as my official pick i actually agree i think uh, josh berkman is a live dog now as nick outlined there is a very realistic path to victory for dong hyung kim i mean he had a very good ground game good judo strong top control that he utilized for most of his early ufc run And then he kind of fell in love with his striking after he scored that crazy wild knockout against Eric Silva. And then he just started standing and banging with everybody. 
And it caught up to him in his last fight against Tyron Woodley when, you know, he threw a crazy spinning back fist and then just ate a huge counter shot and went down. Uh, Dong Hyun Kim does not have a great chin uh, against Carlos Condit. He ate that brutal flying knee and got put out. And then obviously his most recent fight, he definitely went down pretty easily against Woodley. So it's a very real possibility that a guy with some good power like Josh Berkman could put Dong Hyun Kim down if this fight stays standing. Kim has good power in his own right, but Josh Berkman took the, some of the best shots from Hector Lombard and kept coming. So I'm not worried about Josh Berkman's uh, durability whatsoever. Now, the thing I'm worried about with Josh Berkman is the ground game. He has shown okay ground uh, submission ability on the ground, but I think his defensive wrestling is not that good. His scrambling is not that great. As you saw in the Steve Carl fight for the World Series of Fighting title, uh, Berkman gassed pretty badly, and he got repeatedly put on his back. So I think there's a very realistic possibility that if Dong Hyung Kim decides to wisen up and stop just throwing haymakers and being a real sloppy, crazy, aggressive striker, that he should be able to take Berkman down and keep him down. But I just don't know if he's going to do that because he he got a taste of that, the crowd loving him, and, and he just starts... Uh, started throwing a lot of haymakers and some of them started connecting. He started getting some crazy knockouts and he might just come out there and try to do that again. So it, this fight entirely hinges on Dong Hyun Kim's uh, mental standing and, and how he's going to implement his game plan. But I think uh, Josh Berkman is a very live dog here. I'm going to pick him. Now, Reed, what do the numbers tell us for this one? Well, I think it's it's a mixed bag here, and I think I agree with you that there's a lot of uncertainty, especially with Berkman. Um, we're not really sure who he is yet uh, in his second UFC run. He got picked apart by Hector Lombard and yet never got finished. And that's almost a plus in my book um, to be able to face a guy that muscled out and survive. Um, Berkman's technical striking isn't all that great. His defense is poor. Um, his accuracy is low. His power rating, at least based on UFC performance, is also low. So the stand-up striking favors Kim in terms of precision and defense and power, but he actually has the lower output in terms of volume. Uh, it does help that he's a more rangy, longer wingspan southpaw. So the the standing matchup does, I think, lean a little bit towards Kim, although with Berkman's resiliency, you never know. He might just be scrappy and gut this out, and then... The same thing goes for the ground. Kim clearly has better ground metrics in almost every single category, utilizing his wrestling. It's not to say that Berkman's a slouch. He also used his wrestling pretty well, but just not as well as Kim. And so I, I think, again, the numbers sway Kim, but there's some uncertainty because Berkman has proven to be pretty crafty. He's a, he's a veteran. He's got a lot of moves that he can pull out. Um, and Kim, you know, maybe has been a little bit reckless at times. So, the numbers do like Kim here, and I would pick him outright, but I agree that it's dangerous to lay a lot of juice on him or throw him in too many parlays because Berkman is scrappy. He could just find a way to win two rounds and, and grind it out, um, or you know he might even catch Kim with something if he's getting too aggressive. So there's, there's a lot of volatility in this matchup, and I can see why there's uh, differing opinions on who might win. Now dropping down to the flyweight division for the preliminary card main event, we have John Dodson, who is 17 and 6, taking on Zach Makovsky, who is 19 and 5. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight, and how has the public shifted things so far? I opened Dodson minus 400, the comeback on Makovsky plus 280, and right now it's minus 450 plus 360. So more parlay action coming in towards Dodson. Again, not surprised. Dodson is obviously one of the best guys at flyweight. Um, he even hung in there with the champ, Demetrius Johnson, who's looked phenomenal. So. He's right there. I mean, and he's in line for another title shot, probably, if he uh, gets the win over Makovsky here. This is an intriguing fight because I think Makovsky actually matches up pretty well with Dotson. I think Makovsky's a tremendous fighter overall. Um, he's so well-rounded. He's got a little bit of everything. He's not bad on the feet. He's got some decent striking. He's got the wrestling and the grappling to go along with it. So he's not going to be an easy out for Dotson. And honestly, the line's probably a bit high. Um, that being said, I mean, Dotson is more explosive. He's the better athlete here. Um, Makovsky's probably want to get this, gonna want to get this fight to the floor and control Dotson, but it's a very hard task to do. I mean, Dotson, you can momentarily put him on his back for, 
you know, a short time, but he ends up popping back up more, more times than not. His scrambling ability is great. And then on the feet is where I think he's the most dangerous because he's so fast and he's so powerful. I mean, the guy hits like a truck, really. And for flyweight, he's one, definitely one of the hardest hitters in the weight class. So Mikovsky has eaten some punches. His defense isn't that bad, but against a guy like Dotson, he's not going to want to stand and bang with him too long because he's going to probably end up getting at least rocked on the feet. Mikovsky's a pretty tough guy. He's never been KO'd, but. I mean, there's a first time for everything, and Dotson has that kind of knockout power that he could do it. Now, Dotson has been out with injuries for a while, so there is a little bit of concern. Um, he should be able to, to bounce back and perform well here against Mikovsky, but overall, I do think it's going to be a far more competitive than the current odds indicate. Um, and if it hits the scorecards, I think we're going to see a pretty close decision, but you got to give the edge to Dotson almost across the board here. I think the better pure grappler is, is Mikovsky, obviously, but that's still probably not going to matter here because Dotson will be able to, to maintain this fight on the feet and then just use his movement and his speed and his power to probably outpoint Mikovsky. So I agree with most. I mean, Dotson should get the W here. Yeah, and looking at this fight, I actually definitely feel like this is John Dodson's fight to lose. The, the main thing here, the biggest differential in this fight is the explosiveness and power of John Dodson. In my opinion, Dodson is the most powerful pure puncher in the flyweight division even more than guys like John Lineker, Joseph Benavidez, any of them. I think if a Dodson connects with you with anything really hard, he can put anybody out in the division. I mean, you saw it against a guy even like John Moraga, who is tough as nails. Even he couldn't uh, stand up there against Dodson for extended periods of time. So I do feel like even though Zach Makovsky, as Nick mentioned, had never been knocked out, I don't think he's ever even been hurt in a fight. But if John Dodson hits you, I think he gets hurt. So... Uh, Mikovsky, even though he has improved on the, on the feet, his left hook is actually pretty impressive. Dodson is, you know, game changing power. So I, I definitely feel like Dodson will win this fight if it stays standing. If it goes to the ground, Dodson, even though he has a decent wrestling base and he is really athletic, he's not the greatest in terms of a top control and positioning on the canvas. A lot of his opponents are trying to take him down because obviously they don't want to stand and, and getting rocked. I mean, Dotson knocked out TJ Dillashaw of all people on the Ultimate Fighter finale. So there's a, a very real possibility that he wins this fight by knockout. Now on the ground, Mikovsky actually showcased the best wrestling he's he's definitely had in his last UFC fight against Tim Elliott. I mean, that was against a guy that has very, very t good ground skills and top control, and Mikovsky just repeatedly put him on his back and was in control of that fight for the, the majority of it, despite all the, the craziness that Elliot was trying to throw at him. He uh, just held his ground and completely controlled that fight and won a very one-sided decision. So if Mikovsky is able to do anything in this fight, it has to be with the ground game, with the clinch, anything to try to not stand in front of Dotson for extended periods of time. So Mikovsky has a realistic path to victory with the wrestling, but I don't think it'll be enough. The only concern, as Nick mentioned earlier, is the injury to Dodson. He's coming off of his second knee injury, and those do slow you down. They might take away some of that snap in his step. So we might see a bit of a slower John Dodson, but I don't think it'll be too much. And I think uh, Dodson is able to either outwork Mikovsky and get a decision or put Mikovsky away with a knockout. So my pick is John Dodson. Now, Reed, what do the numbers tell us for this one? Well, the numbers are pretty obvious for John Dodson. He does have the highest knockdown rate in flyweight history. Uh, he has seven career knockdowns, scored 8.5% knockdown rate, which puts him ahead of most heavyweights. Um, when you think about it, that's kind of crazy. Basically, if he hits some guy 12 times with a power strike to the head, chances are that guy is going to go down. Um, to date, that's actually most of his opponents. Um, he is He's basically knocked people out, knocked people silly. Even in defeat, he knocked down... Mighty Mouse, uh, before losing later in the fight. So his power really is, um, it is the game changer, as you said, Brian. It's, it's a game changing power. It separates him from the rest of the pack. Elsewhere, it's actually more in Makovsky's favor. Makovsky has been controlling the cage better, has better defense. Um, he attempts a lot of takedowns, obviously, and he's been controlling people on the ground. It's not, you know, it's not domination, um, but it's enough to stay busy and win rounds. And that's the concern with Dodson. He drops rounds. When he's not knocking people out, he's dropping rounds. And so 
uh, that's that's a concern here, right? You know, Makovsky has a clean chin. He's never been knocked out. Uh, his defense is above average or, you know, the flyweights are hard to hit. So he's, you know, average there and not getting hit very much. So if he doesn't get dropped and rocked early round to round, this is potentially very competitive. And Makovsky, I am, I admit some bias here. Makovsky is a former client. So I might be reading a little bit too much into this, but Makovsky knows that he needs to avoid getting knocked out and press the action, use his wrestling keep Dodson on the defensive and it's it's possible he can do that but as Nick pointed out Dodson does pop right back up again he's hard to keep down he's just so fast so explosive um it, he's like a little springboard you know you, you get him to the ground he just pops right back up so um I I obviously would lean Dodson he has faced stiffer competition he's looked amazing and his power is game-changing power but Mikowski does have a path to victory here should not be countered out um, the lines, you know, this will be the recurring theme on this card is, you know, does the underdog really have a chance? And in this division, given Dodson's power, this is still the flyweight division. They're fast. They're going to be all over the place. If they, if Mikowski keeps it on the ground for extended periods of time, that just limits Dodson's ability to land those power punches. So he does have a chance. I would be very wary about laying this kind of juice. Um, at the same time, you know, Mikowski's Really, his only chance for victory here is to grind out a decision. Um, and it's still a long shot, but, you know, it's possible. All right, excellent. Thanks, Reed. Now, kicking off the main card, we have another flyweight contest. This one between Joseph Benavides, who is 21 and 4, and John Moraga, who is 16 and 3. Now, Nick, what's the MMA odds maker's perspective on this one? I opened Benavidez minus 505, the comeback on Moraga plus 335. And right now, over at five times, it is minus 600 for Benavidez and plus 450 on Moraga. So more support coming on, coming in on JB. Not really that surprised. Um, I mean, stylistically, this is a nightmare matchup for Moraga. Um, Benavidez is just really better in all areas, all aspects of the game. I think, I mean, obviously you got to start with the feet. I think Benavides is a little bit faster. He's got a little bit more knockout power to go along with it. Um, on the ground, Benavides has a big edge, I think, in the wrestling, uh, overall grappling and submission game. I know Moraga has a pretty decent jiu-jitsu to go along with it, but I still think that Benavides is just better everywhere. Now, the question here, and the only way, honestly, I see Moraga winning this fight, is if he can maintain it on the feet for a period of time and then just land a big bomb on Benavides. Because we did see Demetrius Johnson knock Benavides out, uh, which was a surprise to most, especially how quick it was and, and how it kind of went down. So we that could be, you know, the puncher's chance that Moraga needs to, uh, to end this fight. But I think that's basically it. I know Moraga, again, going back to his jiu-jitsu, he's got decent BJJ. I don't think he catches Benavides. If anybody gets submitted here, I mean, if Benavides gets around your neck, he's another one of these guys that you can't do much about it. I mean, he's just such a great finisher um, on the feet or on the ground that, you know, you're pretty much done when he, he does get in a, a dominant position like that. Um, and there's not much you can do about it. So, on the scorecards, I do think Benavides outpoints Moraga pretty clearly. And I do think, like I said, he could, he has finishing potential as well. So everybody parlaying Benavides, I can understand it. Um, but you do have to be a little cautious with Moraga's knockout power as well, because like I said, he could possibly land something on the feet to put him out. So that's the concern here. But overall, it's another spot. I mean, realistically, it's Benavides fight to win or lose. If he doesn't get caught by anything crazy, he's going to, I don't want, I don't want to say easily in any fight, but he should win of a pretty clear unanimous decision here. So hard to pick against JB. I think he does get the nod here. Yeah. And I'm going to keep this one pretty short and simple. Joseph Benavides is just way better than John Moraga in just about every category. The only difference here is maybe John Moraga has a slightly better chin. I mean, both guys have been knocked out once, although Moraga's was more of a doctor stoppage, but he did get hurt by John Dodson. So I, I just think that Overall, Joseph Benavides is the better wrestler. I think he has better submissions. I think he's the better pure power puncher. And he has a better pace. I mean, he does everything uh, just a little bit better. I mean, he does swing a little wildly at times. He can get slightly reckless on the feet. But against a guy like John Moraga, I don't think that'll be too much of a problem because Moraga isn't a technician on the feet. He just has some pretty good power. So... Uh, overall, it's just basically a puncher's chance for John Moraga. Moraga did score a nice little guillotine choke submission against Justin Scoggins recently, but that's about it. Like, there's no way you're going to guillotine choke Joseph Benavides training out of alpha male. So, 
I just feel like Joseph Benavides is better in just about every category, except maybe he's like two inches shorter. And I just don't think John Moraga has the skills to actually utilize any of those advantages in height or reach. So I think Benavides is going to be quicker, stronger, just about everything. So it's Benavides' fight to lose. And I wouldn't be surprised if he got a stoppage either. So my pick is Joseph Benavides. Now, Reed, what do the numbers tell us for this one? Well, this was one I'll be breaking down on MMA Odds Breaker so you can see the complete stats. And what you'll see is that if you line these two guys up in performance metrics, Benavides gets a lot of check marks. Uh, there, he is edging Moraga out in almost every single category and the two where he doesn't, it's really close. Um, so you're right. He does have a lot of advantages here. I think he has been fighting at a higher level. You know, his only losses are to champions, you know, Dominic Cruz, Mighty Mouse. Um, those are high quality guys and, when he was fighting at bantamweight, it somewhat depressed his wrestling stats. So those are also pretty good. Moraga does have the wrestling base. For whatever reason, he has not translated it well into the cage. He's actually been controlled much more often than not on the mat. And that's not a good thing against a guy like Benavidez, who also has a lot of submissions in addition to the control. So um, on the feet, maybe it's a little more even. Moraga does have the puncher's chance here. He is a, he is a strong guy. Benavidez did get caught recently, but at least on paper, Benavidez is going to be the much busier fighter. Um, and he's got more power uh, on a per punch basis. He's racked up six ta- uh, knockdowns in his WBC UFC career. So I think Benavidez here is, uh, across the board is seems to be having advantages in pretty much every category. So it, it should be his fight to win. Um, the line understandably has become, these are the biggest odds in the entire card. So, um, again, not a ton of value here because, um, you know, at this level, Moraga can never be fully countered out. Uh, but certainly Benavidez should be a clear winner. All right. Excellent. Thanks, Reed. Now moving all the way up to the heavyweight division, we have Travis Brown, who is 17, two and one taking on Andre Arlovsky, who is 23 and 10 with one, no contest. Now, Nick, what's the MMA odds makers perspective on this one? I opened Brown minus four or five to come back on Arlovsky plus two eighty five. And right now it's Brown minus four fifty to come back on Arlovsky is plus three sixty. So more support coming in on Brown. Really not surprised. And I agree with the early action on Brown as well. Because I, stylistically, this is another fight that I think is just very difficult for Arlovsky. Now, you got to give him credit where credit to Arlovsky's chin, I think, is one of his biggest issues. And he's been able to take fights and win fights without getting knocked out. And he's looked actually pretty good. So I think you got to credit his training at Jackson's camp for giving him the confidence and, and giving him the tools and everything that he needs to kind of make himself better and get back on track. Because now that is exactly what it is. He's got confidence enough to go out there and knows he's not going to get knocked out because I mean, a mental part of the fight game is, is huge, obviously. And if you're getting knocked out and your chin is so weak, I mean, you go out there the next fight and, you know, it's you're prone to get knocked out again. So the confidence only helps Arlovsky, and it's going to probably help him in this fight as well. But that being said, you can't totally um, just count out chin issues, and Arlovsky's chin will probably fail him at some point, I think, in this fight because Brown has – Decent amount of knockout power. Brown has clear advantages in this fight, I think, almost across the board here, honestly. Because on the feet, I think Brown can actually outpoint Arlovsky. Arlovsky's going to be game, no doubt about it. And Arlovsky has, you have to respect his power. He has enough knockout power where if he lands clean, he can knock out most heavyweights, no doubt about that. So Brown has to be a little bit cautious on the feet. But I think he can still outpoint Arlovsky, be a little bit more active, um, push a little bit more forward and be a little bit more aggressive. And control even up against the the cage in the clinch. So I think he can go that route and do very well against Orlovsky. I think actually if Brown wants to get the fight to the floor, he can also have success on the ground against Orlovsky as well. Maintaining top position, dropping some serious punishment, and making life just miserable for Orlovsky. So even though Orlovsky has looked better and he's been on a a pretty solid win streak here and his confidence is at an all-time high, I still think matchup-wise this is a very difficult fight. And Brown's so close to a title shot. I mean, he's just right there. I think that he's going to be motivated enough and realize that this is obviously he's going to have some confidence. These guys have trained together in the past as well at Jackson's camp. So they know each other fairly well. I think that that's actually going to play into Brown's hands a little bit more because I think he's going to have the confidence. He's going to realize that, Hey, I can go out there and pretty much beat this guy any which way. And, and he's going to do it. So he's going to get the job done. And then we're going to probably see Brown being a fight or two away from uh, getting a title shot as well. So Travis Brown's fight to win or lose. Um, Arlovsky, again, you got to be a little cautious with his pure knockout power because he can 
land and maybe possibly put anybody out. So you got to be cautious there. One of those situations, he does have a puncher's chance, but overall I think that Travis Brown can win a decision or he can knock Arlovsky out. So my pick is going to be Travis Brown. And I completely agree. This is actually one of the more one-sided fights on the card for me. Andre Arlovsky, everybody's out there saying that he's back, but the more you look at it, the worse it looks because in my opinion, he lost that first fight to Brandon Schaub. It was pretty ugly performance. And then, yeah, he scored a great knockout against Bigfoot Silva. But look how Bigfoot Silva has looked lately. I mean, he has been a shell of himself ever since he stopped taking TRT. He just goes down so easily. His chin is atrocious. And in my opinion, I think Andrei Olovsky's completely overblown. Like, he really isn't any better than he was before. And... I think uh, going in there, he's about to get a real reality check against Travis Brown. So this is the type of fight where you throw MMA math out the window because, uh, yeah, Antonio Silva beat Travis Brown way back in the day, but Brown got hurt in that fight. He lost all of his mobility and athleticism, and then Silva was still riding that uh, TRT wave a little bit. So uh, in this fight, uh, all the problems that Arlovsky has had in his career are still there. So he's still going to have a, a pretty rough chin. I think his speed is not going to be even close. His explosiveness is going to be less than Brown. I think Brown will be quicker. I think Brown will have just as good a cardio. And I definitely think that Brown will be the first one to the punch. Plus, he's bigger and longer and taller. So I think overall, it's it's a really tough fight for Andre Olovsky here. Uh, Brown could land a, a nasty kick that are, could connect with Arlovsky and Arlovsky wouldn't even be able to fire back because he's just not going to be in range, even though he is a pretty big heavyweight in his own right. So I just think this is absolutely Travis Brown's fight to lose. I think that he's doing a lot of good things right now with his career, mixing it up with uh, the stand-up end on the ground. And, and he's one of the more dangerous heavyweights in the entire roster. So my pick is Travis Brown. Now, Reed, what do the numbers tell us for this one? Well, I'm in full agreement with you guys here. Um, I don't think Arlovsky has a lot for Travis Brown. And Travis Brown's losses, um, he was injured in both of them, you know, because got injured early on, won a leg, won a broken hand, and that led to his eventual defeat. Although, again, the fact that he stood there and took a beating from Verdum for five rounds is pretty impressive. He is a tough guy, and he is deceivingly strong. He is very athletic for such a tall guy. Um, and I think all of those things are, are just the new generation of MMA heavyweight compared to the old school, uh, you know, powerful and aggressive Arlovsky. I just think Arlovsky is going to get outclassed here. They both have power. Uh, but again, Brown's durability is much better, especially his chin. Uh, he's even more willing to take a punch, although that's more risky. And then on the ground, um, you know, Brown has been way more successful on the ground. He, he has actually controlled people more often than not, whereas Arlovsky has ended up on his back almost three quarters of the time. So yes, I, I was one who picked Arlovsky to knock out Bigfoot, but now I think people are realizing that that wasn't as crazy a scenario as people thought it was going into the fight. And uh, Brown, again, his losses were situations where he was injured. So barring a, a hidden injury or of some kind of fluke in the first round, he has advantages all over the place, and I think it's just a matter of time when he wins this. All right, excellent. Thanks, Reed. Now, moving down to the lightweight division, we have Donald Cerrone, who is 27 and 6 with one no contest, taking on John McDessie, who is 12 and 3. Now, Nick, what's the MMA odds maker's perspective on this one? I opened Cerrone minus 305, the comeback on McDessie plus 225. So, this has been a major change in line movement right now. It's Cerrone minus 500. The comeback on McDessie is plus 400. So absolutely zero respect going out there for McDessie in this spot. Um, I, again, stylistically, it's hard to imagine McDessie winning this fight. And I understand it. I, I do understand why people are thinking that it's, I mean, Cerrone is almost a lock. Um, he has advantages across the board. I mean, he's going to be the longer fighter. He's obviously has a ton of skill on the, on his feet. Um, he can mix his kicks in well, which seems to give, uh, McDessie a little bit of problems, um, with longer fighters that have a kicking game, obviously as well. So Cerrone could beat him on the feet. Cerrone has a clear edge on the ground. I think his wrestling is severely underrated. And if he wants to get this fight to the floor, I think 
really, Cerrone, if, if he's persistent about it, he can get this fight to the floor. And once it is on the ground, I think he could finish Magdesia fairly quickly because his jiu-jitsu is legit as well. So anywhere this fight takes place, Cerrone does have an edge. But I still think the line's honestly out of hand, out of whack right now. It's just getting a little bit ridiculous because Magdesi against any striker that he's faced thus far in the UFC, even if he's been outpointed, he's been close and competitive. And also you got to consider that Magdesi has a tremendous amount of knockout power for being a smaller guy. I mean, the guy is very precise with his striking and he could put most guys out at 155, no doubt about it. And, and when you look at Cerrone, I mean, offensively, the guy is outstanding. Like I just mentioned across the board, no doubt about it, but defensively, he does get tagged and he has been rocked in several of his fights. I mean, he's tough enough where he recovers fast and he continues to go on and usually wins a fight. Even if he does get rocked, uh, he, ha- he has that warrior mentality. So he's a hard guy to finish. No doubt about that. But McDessie will land on Cerrone along the way too. If he could keep off his back, which I think he probably will. Cause Cerrone, you know, sometimes, I mean, he's a very intelligent fighter, but sometimes he, he'd prefer to stand and bang and just make the fight exciting than honestly maybe take the fight to the ground and make it easier for him. So if it's like that, then I think if it stays standing, it's going to be a very competitive fight, far more competitive than everybody's actually giving McDessie credit for here. And I think that McDessie does have a better chance than people realize it and landing that knockout punch and clipping Cerrone because McDessie has kind of that – Killer instinct. When once he does get you rocked, I mean, he can finish the job. So even though Cerrone has recovered against others, he might not against Macdessie. So I'm just saying all this because, again, I think it's just a little bit too much disrespect. Macdessie hasn't been this big of an underdog um, in his UFC career thus far, and he's fought pretty decent competition. Not the level of competition that Cerrone's faced, no doubt about it. And Cerrone is close to a title shot, and deservingly so. But at minus 500. Ah, I'm just still shaking my head a little bit at that because I don't think the line should be that quite that high. But that being said, I have to pick Cerrone as well because I do understand why people are confident in Cerrone. He is the better, more skilled, talented fighter across the board. And McDessie's really probably going to have to land that puncher's shot to win this fight as well. Now, if it hits the scorecards, I think, and especially if it stays upright, it should be competitive. It should be fairly close, but... Still, the edge goes to Cerrone. So, yes, I am picking Cerrone, and I expect Cerrone to come through with a victory here. So all of you guys that got in on the early line are probably going to win it. But if the line creeps up even higher, there could very well be some value on MacDessie. Um, my, my official pick is going to be Cerrone. You look at this fight, and basically it's a, similar to MacDessie's last fight against Shane Campbell, except Donald Cerrone is more well-rounded. He's a little more dangerous, but I mean, he's just about as big as Campbell, just about as long, just as good of a striker, probably a little bit better striker on the feet. And then he has an incredible ground game to back it up. And Cerrone on the, on the, on the canvas, I mean, he completely neutralized Miles Jury on the ground in his lat, in a, a couple fights ago. And it made Jury a completely different fighter. So I think against McDessie, it w- I wouldn't be surprised if this fight goes to the ground and Cerrone submits it on the feet. I think it is going to be a little bit competitive. Cerrone does have a better use of distance than Campbell did. So I expect Cerrone to be wailing away with some heavy kicks. McDessie just ate some leg kicks from Campbell. And I think Cerrone has some of the best leg kicks other than Edson Barboza in the whole roster. So I definitely feel like the, the kicks could be a big factor here. And then Cerrone has some pretty heavy punching power as well. So he can follow those up. Uh, neither guy is the greatest defensively, so I definitely think, think somebody's going to be getting tagged. Somebody probably is going to get knocked out. Uh, I definitely think there's going to be a finish in this fight, especially with the, how aggressive McDessie was in that last fight against Campbell. And with McDessie taking this fight on relatively short notice, there's a, a very realistic possibility that he's going to have to have a, a sense of urgency in that first round to really come out there and try to make something happen quickly or else uh, maybe he'll just run out of steam. So I I do expect Donald Cerrone to be the better, more well-rounded overall fighter, but as Nick mentioned, his defense is not that great. McDessie showed some pretty impressive power in that last fight, and he stayed on Campbell until he got the finish. So uh, Cerrone does have a history of getting tagged in fights, eating some big shots, and he has been hurt before. So McDessie could hurt him. He is a very, very talented striker, but I just think the well-roundedness of Cerrone's game is going to be a little too much, and especially with his size and length. I think uh, this is Donald Cerrone's fight to lose, so I'm going to pick him. Now, Reed, what do the numbers tell us for this one? 
Yeah, they agree. Uh, you know, Donald Cerrone has faced the much stiffer talent here. He keeps performing, coming through. He's actually one of the guys who has outperformed the betting lines the most. I mean, basically because he's been on such a long winning streak. Um, but with all the action coming in on him, people are discounting the striking ability of Mac Desi. He is a very short range lightweight and he is definitely a striking specialist. He has actually never even landed a takedown in the UFC, but his his striking is awesome. He is very, very accurate. 40% accuracy. That's off the charts. 84% defense, which means his, his opponents only hit him with 16% accuracy. So basically he's more than twice as accurate as everybody he's faced so far. Whereas Donald Cerrone, his accuracy is low, but he's willing to come forward. He has lots of power and he's willing to take a lot of punches. So his defense is bad. That actually plays right into MacDessie's strength. He wants some guy to walk forward with loose defense being aggressive and just precision strike and counter strike. So on paper, the matchup stylistically is perfect for MacDessie. The question is, will Cerrone actually stand with him or will he get smart and play it more conservative and take it to the ground where he's going to have a huge advantage? Um, or, you know, is he going to land something of his own on the way in? You know, because Cerrone is very, very powerful. 13 career knockdowns. That's actually more knockdowns than anyone on the entire card, including Rumble Johnson, which is hard to imagine, including Andre Orlovsky and guys like that. So um, in terms of power, Cerrone definitely has it. Mcdessey also has it, um, but he's going to be short range. So I I think the best play here is probably the under or the not go the, does not go the distance because I agree with you Brian I think there's a lot of finishing potential here if they do stand and trade both of these guys could end the other one's night um if Cerrone wisely takes it to the ground he clearly is able to win by submission he's got a very slick submission game he's a tall lanky guy for his division so um that helps so I see lots of finishing potential here but I also am not going to lay the juice on Cerrone. That's just too much. Um, a MacDessy TKO would not be out of the question just because of the way the matchup falls. Uh, that said, you got to lean with Cerrone, just maybe not at the current odds. All right, excellent. Thanks, Reed. Now moving on to the co-main event of the evening, we have a middleweight title fight between champion Chris Weidman, who is 12-0, taking on Vitor Belfort, who is 24-10. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight? And how has the public shifted things so far? I open Weidman minus 475, the comeback on Belfort plus 325. And right now it is Weidman minus 525, the comeback on Belfort is plus 415. So again, it, line's been out for a while for this fight. So there has been some straight action, some parlay action coming in on Weidman here. And there has been some action back on Belfort a little bit as well, some straight action. So even though the line has moved a little bit, it's still fairly close at the sports books. Um, and they're going to probably need Belfort to uh, come through with the win. And again, another parlay buster here, or they're likely going to lose small in this fight. But that being said, matchup wise, I mean, this is a good matchup for Weidman because I think overall Belfort, of course, we've all heard about the TRT issues and he's clean. He's been tested several times throughout this process before this fight. Um, so it seems like he's going to be, clean and you know now not on any roids in this in this spot here at all so if that's the case i think that is gonna hinder him a little bit and uh especially against a an amazing fighter like weidman um it's just belfort's best chance to win this fight is again another puncher's chance landing that knockout punch i mean one thing he's not going to lose is his technique i think that belfort definitely has a skill set to make life miserable for a lot of guys out there and he deserves the spot where he's at right now as far as i mean look at his resume and look at the people that he's knocked out recently again you could put a little question mark by that because of the trt or whatever but still the technique is there so belfort has enough power, has enough technique, even without TRT, to maybe land and catch Weidman and knock him out. So there, there's the caution there as well. I mean, we could say the same thing. It seems about a lot of these fights. There's a lot of puncher's chances on this uh, on this card from top to bottom. But is it going to happen? The majority of the big favorites are going to probably come through, and I believe that with Weidman as well because Belfort has a tendency to slow down as the fight goes. So even if Weidman weathers the early storm, I think he should be able to take control, take over, get this fight to the ground if he wants. And once he's on top, I think Weidman can do some serious damage to Belfort with this ground and pound. I mean, his submission game is good enough to make life miserable for Belfort as well. Both these guys have a good submission game, so I understand Belfort is game on the ground as well. But I still give the edge to Weidman overall on the ground. And even on the feet, I think Weidman can actually knock Belfort out. 
He's been knocked out a few times now throughout his career. Weidman has a tremendous amount of knockout power. I mean, it's scary. The guy can barely touch you, and he can put you out as well. So I think it's a winnable fight for Weidman anywhere the fight takes place. I don't expect this fight to go a full five. I think Weidman probably finishes him maybe by round three um, when Belfort starts to fade a little bit more, or we could see it sooner. If it, I mean, if the TRT truly had a negative impact um, by being off it for Belfort, we're going to see it, and it's going to be pretty clear here. So it's Weidman's fight to win or lose. I think he's motivated for this fight, obviously, and I think this is actually compared to some of the other competition that he's faced recently. This is kind of a, an easier fight for him. So the question marks behind Weidman are, of course, he seems to be a little injury prone, and that's not a good thing at all. But I think he's recovered. He's had enough time to recover. His training seems to be going well. And again, mentally, I think Weidman, that's one of the best aspects of his game as well. Um, so a lot of good things about Weidman. He's a tremendous champion, and he's going to be a hard guy to dethrone, honestly. And I don't think Belfort's a guy to do it. So just like most, I'm going to pick Weidman. I think Weidman probably finishes Belfort along the way. Yeah, it's tough to pick against Chris Weidman. At this point in his career, he's one of the more complete fighters on the entire UFC roster. Vitor Belfort's a lot older, but he has uh, been in there and very experienced against some top-level competition. The problem is there are several things going against Vitor here. The First of all, he, he's been out for an extended period of time waiting for this title shot. He had, did not fight in all of 2014 and then... Uh, for the first five months here of 2015. So it's been almost about 18 months since he's last competed. That is ridiculous. And I don't know. He's going to be very rusty. At this type, at his age, you can't afford to be sitting on the sidelines for that extended amount of time. Now, uh, the other thing going against Vitor, as Nick mentioned, is the, the TRT. He's not able to take it anymore. And while he was on it, he went on the best run of his entire career, knocking out Michael Bisping, Luke Rockhold, and then Dan Henderson to earn this opportunity. Now, against Chris Weidman, I don't think the knockout's going to be as big of a threat. I mean, Weidman's been in there against Leoto Machida, Anderson Silva twice. He's taken some of their shots, and he's just kept coming forward. He has a terrific chin. He doesn't rely on the chin, though. He does use some good defense and head movement, some subtle head movement. And he has some great pressure and power on the feet, as we've seen in the Anderson Silva knockout. And then on the ground, he is a very special fighter. When he gets on top of you, he has great pressure, great top control, a good base. He does all the little things. He has very, very good ground and pound as well. He is just a complete fighter. The one thing that I was always worried about him was his conditioning. But then he went five rounds with Leona Machida and only slowed down a little bit. So I think against Vitor, Weidman will actually be the, the more conditioned fighter. Uh, Vitor is dangerous. He does have a lot of power, but I don't think he has anything that Weidman hasn't seen. I don't think he throws any harder than anyone Weidman's ever faced before. So I think Weidman will be able to handle whatever Vitor throws at him and then just keep coming forward, keep pressuring him, and eventually will make the, the Brazilian wilt. So I really do feel like this is uh, a chance to showcase just how good Chris Weidman is and how much better he's become. And I expect Chris Weidman to not just win, but win impressively here against Vitor Belfort. So my pick is Chris Weidman. Now, Reed, what do the numbers tell us for this one? Well, they definitely back up uh, the issues with Vitor Belfort. I mean, first of all, he has the highest per, per strike knockdown rate of any UFC fighter in history at 20%. Basically, one in five of the power head strikes he lands drops his opponent. He has seven career knockdowns. So he wins early, fast, and in spectacular fashion, except when he doesn't, um, which, you know, his chin is equally bad. He has far and away the worst chin on the entire card. Basically, his opponents have a similar knockdown rate as he does, which is crazy to think about. So when he gets hit, he is falling down. Um when it comes round to round, he, ha he has the slowest pace of any fighter on the card. So Chris Weidman will be throwing on average twice as many strike attempts as Belfort. Uh, Weidman is going to have the bigger range. So he's going to be pushing Belfort around the cage. Belfort's going to be waiting, waiting, trying to counter strike. Um, and he certainly has the power to do it. But you're right. Weidman has faced dangerous strikers before uh and ones that are southpaws and ones that are bigger and just as powerful as Belfort in Anderson Silva and Leota Machida. So this is nothing new for Weidman. He knows he has to be careful, especially early on, but he also knows he, he can knock this guy out. And if he mixes in his wrestling, 
Um, and you know, his top game is stifling. It's powerful. He also has submissions. Wyman does have a number of advantages here. The only one, you know, Belfort has that chance is that counter striker bomb that he could launch. And we, I am personally not convinced that he's still going to have that kind of power coming off TRT. It has now been some time since he's come off the hormones. He was basically competing on the juice for a long time. We don't know how long, but definitely during that impressive s- string of knockouts that he had in the UFC, um, even into his mid thirties, he looked phenomenal. He looked like one of the most in shape guys in the entire UFC. And now we know why. So it'll be interesting, first of all, to see him weigh in, um, to see how he looks, to see if he has the same muscle mass. I don't think he should. Uh, and if he doesn't, he probably doesn't have the same kind of, um, fast twitch power that he's shown in the past. And so I do think that Wedman, Weidman just weathers the early storm. And then one way or the other, he is going to finish this fight because the longer it goes, he's going to run away with it. Belfort cannot keep up with Weidman's pace and, uh, the dangerous attack that he has on the feet and on the ground. So Weidman inside the distance is definitely my firm pick. Um, Playing the two and a half round total is a little difficult because Belfort did hang in there with John Jones quite, quite into the four, all the way into the fourth. Um, but that was again, you know, Jones really isn't the one punch guy and he did almost get caught in an arm bar. I think that slowed things down. Uh, but Weidman, I think he finishes this. Uh, it's just hard to say uh, above or below the total. So, um, the inside the distance play is mine. All right. Excellent. Thanks, Reed. Now this takes us to the main event of the evening. We have Anthony Johnson, who is 19 and 4, taking on Daniel Cormier, who is 15 and 1 for the UFC light heavyweight title. Now, Nick, what's the MMA odds maker's perspective on this one? I've been Cormier minus 140, the comeback on Johnson plus 110, and right now it's minus 135 plus 115. So line margins have tightened up a bit, and there is a decent amount of two way action across the board on this fight, no doubt about it. Competitive fight. I mean, it's unfortunate what happened to John Jones and the whole situation and surrounding that, but we still get a quality fight here, um, you know, for the light heavyweight title. So you got to respect it for what it is. Both these guys, Cormier and Johnson, in my opinion, deserve to be up there fighting for the gold. I mean, if you look at Johnson, what he's been able to accomplish recently, I'm still surprised, to be honest with you. I mean, this is the guy that was fighting at 170. I mean – way back when and he I, i'm just amazed that he was able to make that division now looking at it and you know he had some success back then as well but the transformation since his loss honestly to belfort you know and, and since he was released by the ufc the guy has matured quite a bit i mean you got to credit the black zillions i think for that as well um with this training camp i mean he, they got him mentally physically prepared the guy has cardio now and, and back in the day again he used to fade you couldn't trust his cardio his fight iq was terrible He's really improved on all of that stuff and combine that with the nasty knockout power that the guy has. I mean, he's a beast on the feet. I mean, if you look at what he did, uh, honestly, to Gustafson, who's done that? Nobody's done that. Even John Jones wasn't able to dominate Gustafson like that and put him out as fast as he did. Look what he did to Phil Davis when he was able to just stuff all those takedowns and just honestly embarrass Phil Davis on the feet. I mean, that was a beating Davis took. You got to credit Davis for even hanging in there. So... Johnson has faced some solid competition and he's looked tremendous. I mean, that's why I'm a little bit surprised that, I mean, Cormier, on the other hand, I think honestly, I mean, that fight with Jones was actually competitive, a lot more competitive than probably the majority of the community out there is giving him credit for. He was game. Um, even in the clinch, he surprised me how well he was able to do, honestly, with uh, John Jones there. So Cormier, obviously, we all know how good his wrestling is. It's phenomenal. I mean, one of the best wrestlers in MMA, period. Um, the guy has some power. The guy has some skill on the feet. The guy has a decent fight IQ to go along with it. Um, and Jones was his first and only loss in his MMA career. So you got to credit Cormier for, for getting this to this spot and accomplishing what he has thus far. And I think he's a phenomenal fighter as well. So this is a very intriguing matchup. I mean, will Cormier's wrestling be enough to get Johnson down here and control him? And I think if he does get positional control on the ground, Cormier is smart enough to know that, hey, maybe I'll take this guy's back and, um, you know, sink in the rear naked choke because that seems to be a flaw back in the day, at least for Anthony Johnson. And, you know, it's hard to defend against the rear naked chokes when you do get in that spot. So I think Cormier is going to look for that. I don't know if he's going to have success um, at doing so, though, because Johnson's takedown defense has looked a lot better. And as far as striking goes on the feet, I mean, Cormier is definitely game and he's competitive with most people. But Johnson 
is going to be a little bit too much for him. He's going to be a little bit longer. He's got the more pure knockout power, obviously, to go along with it. Um, he's just a far more the dangerous striker of the two. So even though Cormier has a very solid chin and he's looked pretty good throughout his MMA career, I'm not sure how much punishment he's going to be able to take from Johnson if Johnson starts unloading on him. So Cormier is definitely going to need to take this fight to the ground and do what he does best just smother Johnson, maybe not even submit him. I'm thinking that's the easiest path to victory, obviously, for Cormier, and he knows that more likely. But Cormier could also obviously get the fight to the ground and just control the tempo of the fight, drop some ground to pound. I mean, he ragdolls people at times. I mean, look what he was able to do to Dan Henderson. Say what you will about Dan Henderson at his age, but still, that was a pretty impressive performance overall. Um, so Cormier has that type of ability that he could just be phenomenal and, and at the top of his game for sure. So I'm still going to lean slightly towards Johnson because, I mean, the fighters that he's faced and the matchups that he's faced should have been very difficult for him. And he's looked great doing so. So I think he could possibly continue that against Cormier. You cannot deny the improvement that Johnson has made and, and where he has, he's at at this point of his career. So I really think that Johnson could probably sprawl and brawl his way to another victory here, possibly finish Cormier and be the first one to ever do that, which is again, surprising for me to even say that, but I am going to slightly lean towards Johnson. Um, I think this is going to be a heck of a fight, and I'm really looking forward to this fight. But my official pick is going to be Anthony Johnson. And I'm going to disagree. The main thing here for me is Daniel Cormier's incredible wrestling, his uh, grind, embrace the grind mentality. And I think that that's something that could wear Anthony Johnson down. Now, I know John Jones was able to turn the tables on Daniel Cormier and wear him down. But that's John Jones. He's a completely different fighter than Anthony Johnson. Johnson is an extremely powerful, extremely big, extremely strong light heavyweight. It's crazy to me to think that this guy used to fight at 170 pounds, but he's really embraced being a light heavyweight. He's bulked up. He looks great. He has a ton of power. He can put anybody away. And I just, the main thing for me is I don't know if he'll be able to put Daniel Cormier away. Cormier is a very athletic very dangerous uh, wrestler, and if he sticks to what works best for him, which is the clinch, which is the top control on the ground, the takedowns, I think that he can wear Anthony Johnson down. Johnson is very dangerous when he's on the feet, when he's at distance, when he's working you over with big power punches, but I don't know if Cormier is going to let him do that. Cormier has an incredible ability to just stick to you, and I think that's the type of fight that he needs to have here against Anthony Johnson. I mean, he was gutted when he lost to John Jones. He was very emotional in that fight, and you saw it. I mean, he came out, the fight was close for the first two rounds, and then uh, after Cormier wasn't able to, to really hurt John Jones anymore, he definitely started to fade. So that is a concern here. If Daniel Cormier can't take Anthony Johnson down, he might... Uh, wilt a little bit, especially against somebody that hits as hard as Johnson does. Uh, Cormier could get knocked out here, especially at distance, because even though Cormier is a former heavyweight, Johnson is about three inches taller. He's a the longer fighter. So if he uses that reach, it could be difficult for Cormier. But I do think that Cormier is athletic enough. He is able to get in there with uh, some pretty good explosion and get those takedowns. And he can take advantage of any momentary uh, loss of balance. Or if you're just on the wrong foot, he is going to get in there and put you on your back. And I think that he can keep you there, too. So uh, while Anthony Johnson does have the striking and power advantages, uh, Cormier is a good striker in his own right. He's competent in that department. He'll be able to hold his own enough to get Anthony Johnson to maybe lower his defenses a little bit and then take advantage when Johnson loads up on a big strike. So I expect Daniel Cormier to go out there and really try to make Anthony Johnson work in more than just the striking realm. And I think that he's able to do it. So my pick is Daniel Cormier. Now, Reed, what do the numbers tell us for this one? Well, you guys have boiled it down to Anthony Johnson being the more powerful and effective striker, but Cormier having the wrestling attack that could change the, the dynamic of this fight. And you're absolutely right. Cormier's striking has been good. Um, not amazing, but aggressive enough and technical enough that he's gotten by even against bigger opponents. But he ran into trouble with John Jones, not just a big reach advantage, but Jones isn't a one punch slugger 
he just picks you apart and he's willing to even move backward as, as he does that. And Anthony Johnson has that same ability. We saw it against Phil Davis. Phil Davis was trying to get the fight down, but just getting picked apart and failing to get the takedown. That was Anthony Johnson 2.0. Very different from what we saw in his earlier years where, yeah, he was a, a slugger, but he also could get taken down and submitted with a choke once he got to the ground. So, um, this new Anthony Johnson that is proving very difficult to take down, that's a, that's a game changer for him. I mean, that was a huge hole in his game and he has, he's, completed it. So Cormier has to be very aggressive, even more so than he was against John Jones. And I don't see him being able to pull that off without getting beaten up a little bit on the way in because Johnson has gotten so good and precise at picking people apart like that. So I I agree that there's upset potential here. I'm picking Anthony Johnson. Um, I do not expect the lines to diverge to any extent. I think they should stay very, very close because Cormier is very durable. Neither of these guys has ever been knocked out um, or really hurt that we've seen. So Cormier should be able to to weather some of that storm. He's a big, thick guy. Um, he's you know not tall and lean, where he's going to get his his chin really rattled. But he will take some punishment on the way in. He's a little more durable to be able to do so. So it may take some time to develop. We'll learn a lot, I think, in the first round. Uh, you know, if Cormier actually gets the fight to the ground and gets top control sustained, this immediately becomes a different ball game. You know, chances are he is going to grind this one out. But if he has trouble in that first round, Johnson is fully equipped to just pick him apart for several rounds. And we haven't really seen Cormier um survive that kind of beating. You know, he did he did fade quite a bit, I think, against John Jones at the end. He just kind of mentally gave up. So um I do see Anthony Johnson getting more advantages here uh, especially stylistically, because the guy who beats Rumble Johnson is able to close the gap. Uh, maybe they're big and rangy to to stay out of trouble, but they're also good with submissions and can get it to the ground. And that is not Daniel Cormier. I, you know, he's not big and rangy. He's going to have trouble closing the gap. And if he does get it to the ground, it's not about submissions. So he's going to have to do it over and over again. So I just think stylistically, this isn't the right breed of fighter to beat Anthony Johnson. So that'll do it for our full event breakdown for UFC 187. Part 2 of the Premium Oddscast featuring our premium bets will be out Friday night following the weigh-ins. So stay tuned for that if you're an MMA Odds Breaker Premium member. Also, if you'd like to become a premium member, just go to MMAOddsBreaker.com and you can sign up in the top right corner of our homepage. If we have a free play to give out, make sure to follow at MMAOB Premium on Twitter because that's where we post them first. We can also notify you of our free bets via email if you prefer that method. Just send an email to picks at MMAOddsBreaker.com and we'll add you to our free bet mailing list. Also, feel free to like our Premium Oddscast Facebook page. We post articles, show announcements, and plenty of other information there so you can stay up to date on everything from us if you're interested. Special thanks to our sponsors, Five Dimes and Countermove. Good luck, everyone, and hopefully the betting gods are on your side this week. 